panels today later. Run, 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 run. Oh. Hey, good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. Really, really good to be back. Uh, miss you guys, you know. It's, it's kind of a fun week when you're out on the road all, all alone. <clears throat> so, we have a lot of great things going on. And, uh, of course, we've got some people that are out and about today and, and traveling around. And for those of you who are joining online, good morning this morning, and we, we welcome you here. This is the day that God has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. And we got a lot to be glad for. we got a lot to be thankful for. Uh, we have some wonderful things coming up in here. Uh, we have our Wednesday study and prayer time in here, and... <coughs> We're getting ready to start the Truth Project, and for anybody who would like to see, I put some some uh, brochures on the back table there so you can kind of see what the outline of the study is about. Um, it's a 12-session study. It's 12 different lessons, which will have a DVD, and then we have a study guide. So I put the study guide in the back back there so people can take a look through that as well. But it covers a lot of different things in here. It talks about what veritology is, and veritology is the study of truth. Uh, veritas in Greek is the word truth. And so veritology talks about truth. Uh, lesson two is on philosophy and ex ethics. Lesson three, anthropology, who is man. Lesson number four, theology, who is God. Uh, lesson five, parts one and two, there's two different parts to that. Science, what is true. And lesson six is, whose story is it in history? And sociology is lesson seven, the divine imprint. Lesson eight is on uh, Unio Mystica. Am I alone? Am I the only one in the world? Um, lesson number nine, the state. Whose law? Uh, lesson number 10, the American experiment, stepping stones. Lesson 11, labor created to create things and lesson number 12 is community involvement god cares do i and so we got a lot of neat topics over a, a wide variety a wide range of things we're going to be starting that on may 4th and we have a nifty nifty sign up sheet in here so i'll put that back on the back table back here for you guys and if you would like to sign up for the study guide materials, or Jerry, do you want to pass that around? Go ahead. I'm going to pass it around. You're going to pass it around. I, I kind of figured as much. You have that look about you. <laughs> so May 4th, we're going to start the study on the Truth Project. And, uh, you know, I've mentioned it several times before, but it really is life-changing to go through this and understand all of the different things that come into play within our society and within a biblical worldview versus a world view. And so um, everybody that I know of that has gone through it so far uh, has really had life-changing experiences. And it, it worked wonders for me as when I went through it as well. So May 4th, we're starting the Truth Project. May 7th, Grace Street Cinema is having our next movie called Breakthrough. There's tickets available over there on the table. Feel free to get some and pass it out. As always, the movie's free. We have free food that goes along with it. And, uh, of course, brownie bites and all the good things that come along with that. The popcorn, the hot dogs, and just have a really good uh, fellowship time together as well. May 14th, we are going to be having Orange Track Racing. Again, it just seems like we just had it. And here it is again, but it is wonderful. We had a great crowd last time around. Uh, lots of new people coming in and we transformed this whole area in here into a four lane raceway for Hot Wheels cars. And so it's a great thing for kids. Um, I, I think the youngest one that I remember having in here was three years old and the oldest one was 87. So kids of any age are welcome to come in and join in. And so Orange Track, we look forward to that. And uh, if you have other things that you have coming up in here, please let us know. We are going to be planning a grand opening and kind of a picnic type thing coming up here for um, May. So we want to do it probably before the Memorial Day weekend. 
Uh, we're looking for input for that as well and what you kind of kind of like to do in here and just kind of have a nice open house to kick off our new space in here. So we're got a lot of fun things coming up in here. It's going to be busy and I love it busy. So well, let's uh, let's open up today our worship with a word to God, shall we? Let's invite the Holy Spirit in to join us. Gracious Lord and Heavenly Father, we just praise you and thank you for this opportunity to gather here together in your name. We thank you, Lord, that we are here uh, freely and openly to bless you and to praise you and to thank you for all the wondrous works that you do in our lives each and every day. Lord, we invite the Holy Spirit among us today to come into our hearts and settle into our minds and settle into our spirits as well. Lord, be present in our midst today. We thank you, Lord, that your word tells us that one other two or more are gathered in your name. There I am in your midst, and we just praise you and thank you, Lord, that you are here with us today. Lord, we ask that you would just open our hearts and our minds to hear your word, to hear what we need to hear, to take it forth and, and be your disciples into our community today. I want you to bless Pastor Terry as he's given his message this morning. Uh, he stepped up the last minute, and I just praise you and thank you for that as well. Um, and so, Lord, we just praise you and thank you that you put this upon our hearts, and uh, we're so willing to be able to do your work and your will in our lives. So thank you once more, Lord, for all of these great and wonderful things as we come into this time of worship, and we pray all this in your precious Son, Jesus' name. Amen. So, Pastor Terry, at the last minute, I called him up and said, hey, I'm not going to make it back. I'm still sitting out in Alabama. Mm -hmm. Uh, or Georgia, I guess I was. I was in Georgia Friday night. And I said, I'm not going to make it back. Can you give the message? So I was supposed to give the message today. And so he stepped up without hesitation and said, you bet. Not a problem. And so I really, really, truly thank him for that. Uh, especially at last minute kind of thing there. So uh, knows the order today. What is the order, Jared? Because Bruce, Bruce is out of town because... Uh, otherwise, we'd be doing our music, so we're going to shift the service around. So we're going to kick right into the call to worship this morning, which comes from Matthew 28, uh, verses 18 through 20 in the NIV. And it said, Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them... To obey everything I have commanded you, and surely I am with you always, to the very end of the age. Now these were Jesus' final words to the disciples at the point of time that he ascended into heaven. So we know this portion and this scripture in here in Matthew as the Great Commission, where he commissioned the disciples to go out into the world and, and make disciples of all men. Notice it wasn't just for the Jews, but it was for all men, Jews and Gentiles alike. And so he said that he is going to give all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to him to pass over that authority to us. And so we have got that commission right along with the disciples. And if you've uh, been listening to Christian radio whatsoever, you hear a song from a group Cain that's called The Commission. And it's a wonderful, wonderful song. I invite you to listen to it over and over again. It really speaks to me each time. But this is exactly the verse that it's taken from in Matthew 28. And so I ask you to kind of listen to the song and then try and go back there and listen to it again to get the full breadth of what they're asking. It speaks to us of our obligations as Christians to follow Jesus' words to the disciples, to go out and do instead of just being a disciple instead of just being a student, instead of being just a follower. Now he's telling us, I have taught you all these things and I have given you this authority. Now go and do. You see, Jesus told the disciples to go forth and make disciples of all nations. And those same words that, that he gave to them then are as relevant today as they were then 2,000 years ago. It is our calling to be the hands and feet of God. I have taught you all these things. Now go and do. 
Lord, bless our time as we come into uh, Terry's message this morning and just put your blessing upon him as he gives that message that the words that come from his, uh, his mouth today are echoing what you have put on his heart. And so we ask for those words to be put on our hearts today. Help us to receive those, open our ears to hear, and our minds to understand, and our hearts to accept, and our lives to live out your message to go and do. In Jesus' name, amen. <coughs> I think about the uh, the title of the sermon today. I'm, I'm reminded as uh, when I was a kid. Does anybody remember the the animated shows? Uh, this would be like I don't know, 70s, 80s. Easter is and Christmas is. I can't find them anywhere. For some reason, they sit in my head and uh, they occupy space that I can't find information on. Uh, little snippets here and there, but not the whole things. Well. This morning we're going to talk about what discipleship is. We have just come off an amazing week, Holy Week, where we um, kicked off with Palm. Well, actually, we go all, all the way back to Ash Wednesday when we had our Ash Wednesday service, and through our Lenten studies into uh, Palm Sunday, then our Good Friday service, which was an extremely wonderful service, a very solemn service, and then uh, the celebration that we had last week on our Easter service. The next logical step is to talk about what all that means. And discipleship is what it's about. It's, it's about what becoming disciples. So discipleship by its very definition is the state of being a disciple. So to better understand what discipleship is, we need to find out what being a disciple means. So let's talk about that a little bit this morning. Different people will answer this question in different ways. What being a disciple? What is a disciple? So for being a disciple, it means doing a whole bunch of stuff for Jesus, right? It means we got to go to every worship service and we have to be at every single Bible study and we have to serve in every ministry that we can. Be at every event. Remember on, on Palm Sunday, we talked about FOMO, fear of missing out, because you know, we got to be that super Christian. And then there's others, it's about being hardcore for their Christian faith. It's sharing their faith with everybody, whether they want to hear from you or not. You just get right up in their face and tell them about it. You're handing out tracts or different things to everybody. You may be even like the guy that stands down in the street corner on uh, Farmer's Market, downtown Cedar Rapids, where he's standing on top of his amplifier or speaker there and he's just telling everybody about fire and brimstone you turn or burn <laughs> yeah you should look at our facebook page the top picture it, we ch I, it's been changed it now says god is love it's not these things that that we see but what do these two versions that we just talked about of being a disciple have in common they're overboard they are on, it's like Christianity overload. Or, uh, you know, now the big thing is to put a plus sign after everything. So let's Christianity plus. The problem is, is these could not be further from the truth. Now, years ago, you may have heard a very familiar voice on what used to be KWOF saying a busy Christian isn't necessarily a good Christian. And the person who said that on air is mouthing the words with me as I said them. <laughs> Mark was that voice. And that, of all the things that I may have heard on that station over the years, that has stuck with me more than anything else. Busy Christian isn't necessarily a good Christian. So let's find out what we really need to be doing to become disciples and what discipleship really is. So according to the Bible, being a Christian and being a disciple are the same thing. A disciple of Jesus is someone who follows Jesus 
and learns from him. They learn from the teacher. And it's someone who has a relationship with Jesus. It's also someone who has been changed by that relationship. Or, and someone who is absolutely committed to Christ's mission. See, disciples, as disciples, we are constantly learning the ways of Jesus. And we will continue to learn those ways our entire lives. One of the most basic definitions of discipleship comes from our call to worship this morning. Matthew 28, 18 and 20. Now Mark read from the uh, New International Version. I'm going to read a slightly different version. Listen to the words that come from the New Living Translation. It says, Jesus came and told his disciples, I have been given all authority in heaven and on earth. Therefore, go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And listen to this part of verse 20. Teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I have given you. And then he concludes by saying, be sure of this, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. So what did Jesus tell us here? He says, go. He didn't say sit. And, and there's a pastor that I, he said that I remember this from a sermon. I don't even remember what the rest of the sermon was about. But he said, don't pew in the pews. In other words, don't just sit there and, and, and do nothing. Don't pew in the pews. And in going, we're doing it under whose authority? Our authority? No. Christ's authority, which God gave to him. This whole passage, this whole section, 18 and 20 through 20, it is an ex a really wonderful example, even though it doesn't say it's about the triune God. It's a very wonder, it's a great example of the three persons which make up God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Now he tells us, Jesus does, to make disciples and baptize them. Then what does he tell us to do? He says, teach. Don't just tell. Now you got to go teach. Because you need both. Jesus is telling us that discipleship is about learning. So we learn from the master. And then we go out and we teach. It centers on this being taught and becoming a teacher. Now here's, here's I hear in everybody's head. No, I can't read your minds. This is just what I imagine what's going on in your head. But pastor, I... I don't want to lead a Bible study. That's awkward for me. I can't do that. Well, here's the thing. Teaching happens in many, many different ways. It's not just about leading a Bible study. Although it could be about leading a Bible study. But it may be that you sit down with your kids at night. And instead of watching TV, you sit down and you open up their the Bible that someone in the family got for them. Maybe it was you or grandparents, aunt and uncle, and you read Bible stories with them. You start them learning at an early age. Or maybe it's your teaching by example, how you actually live your life. Not what you profess in the sanctuary, in church, on Sunday. It's what you do when you walk out the door. So when you live your life, are you teaching by example? It also might be, and it should be, and we'll talk about this a little bit later, praying with your family. There's teaching in there. In fact, we're going to talk about Jesus teaching us how to pray here in a little bit. We have to understand that we have to be on the right path in order to get started. And the only way to get on the right path is to go through the things or uh, pay attention and learn from the things that we're going to learn about this morning. And remembering that discipleship is not about going overboard. It's not about being overloaded. It's not about being too busy. It's not Christianity Plus. What it is, is it's for you. It's for me. And it's for everyone else to whom Jesus said, follow me and they said yes 
So what is the goal of discipleship? Goals are extremely helpful in getting us where we want to be. You know, I have a goal at work. I've got this SMART goal. So I, I've got what I want to do, and it's measurable, and I can, I can do all these things with it. And, and I, can, I gave it to my boss, and she said, good job. All right, it's going to get me from here to here. Now, will it take two months or two years? I don't know. Patience. But it's going. It's helping me get where I want to be. And we talked about this morning. I don't know if Mark knew about the, that. I was going to talk about this, but it's it's like roadmaps. Mark was talking about how Google was uh, giving him wrong times and stuff when he was trying to get back. Well, roadmaps are great, right? You remember using? Did anybody ever get out the big atlas? You know that giant thing, and um, maybe. You were alone, so you had it on the seat next to you, and every so often you had to take that unscheduled or maybe even scheduled stop to pull over, look at it, okay, I'm here, and I need, okay, get there. Or maybe, and I was going to see if I had one and I, I forgot, remember the, the maps that you get at the rest areas? And then you fold them up, I'm trying to look it in. What a mess. Well, right after that, this is uh, 25, 30 years ago, so I had a laptop. This, is, this thing was this thick. I mean, it was huge. But I had this program on it. It was a mapping program. Now, I didn't have internet with me, but it, I could have it open in the seat, and it was different than the actual map. So I had that now. I don't have it up here with me, but now I've got my cell phone. It's got mapping programs on it. <laughs> it you may be using uh, Google. You may be saying, hey, Google. You may be asking Siri. You may be pulling. Maybe it's MapQuest. Do you always remember MapQuest? It still exists. It still works. Or maybe you just have one of those little GPS units that you got suction cup to the window so you can see where you're going. But these are tools that help us to get from point A to point B. They tell us how to get where we're going. But they don't tell us why. All they do is say, you're going to go from here to here, and this is how you do it. They tell you how to, but not the why of it. Now, that why may be multitude of different things. It may have been trying to find your way to, to church this morning because we moved. It might be going to a birthday party. It might be going to an anniversary. It might be going on vacation. You may be visiting someone who is ill or, heaven forbid, someone who is in their last moments of their lives. But this A to B attitude of the way a map works, of these mapping programs work, is that, is that how we're treating the activities and the ministries of the church? We just show up and we participate and we leave. Or is that how we're doing that? Are we just along for the ride? Kind of like a lot of the people that were going to line the road that Jesus was riding in on as people were laying palms and garments down for just along for the ride because we want to see what's going on. But here's the thing. We need to ask why. As pastors, we ask, why are we doing this? When it comes to, Mark mentioned orange track. Why do we do orange track? I've seen kids go from diapers. Actually, I saw some of them when they were still in mom's belly, and now I'm seeing those same kids as they're going into high school, <coughs> as they're graduating high school, as they're graduating college. I've actually seen a young man who, through something we used to do in Orange Track, that guided him to one of the career he's ultimately in as a graphic designer. 
but I've also seen the spiritual side of those things. I've seen how that has affected them and how they have grown in the Lord. We don't spend a ton of time teaching and preaching. There's no sermon. There is a devotional. We try to keep that down. Instead of a four-hour sermon, we try to keep that down to about an hour for them. No, it's like five minutes. But it's something that they can learn on and, and take with them as they leave. The why matters. Because why? Because God matters. That's why. Nothing is more beautiful, more lovely, more pure and ultimately limitless than God. God's, I mean, he's the pinnacle. He's, that's where it stops. And I believe that you and I have an opportunity not just to capture, but to recapture a radically God-centered vision for discipleship for Grace Street Church. And that source of that true discipleship is God himself. And the goal of true discipleship is God himself. You see how it's all coming back to God? Fellowship with the triune God is where we are going, and fellowship with the triune God is how we are going to get there. And this is what God revealed to his people through the prophet Habakkuk. Chapter 2, verse 14 from the New International Version has Habakkuk writing this. For the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord. I'm going to stop right there. With the knowledge of the glory of the Lord. The earth will be filled with it. And, and he goes on to give an example of how great that is by saying, as the waters cover the sea. As the waters cover the sea. That's a lot of water. God is that amazing piece of this. Habakkuk wrote this in a time when God's people were questioning God's purposes in the world. What is God up to? What is God's goal? And the prophet answered in this chapter verse. And, and just to kind of put it in, in my own words, it says, one day the whole earth, every single part of it, will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord. We all want that to be today, but it's in God's timing. And as Christians, this is the vision that needs to be driving us. If this is the future of God's world, and it is, that his knowledge would cover all things, then it is our future. And if it is our future, we should know we must pursue it now. It's not something that we must do in the future. It's something we need to do right now now and that's the why behind the what and the how that is the goal of discipleship now discipleship is growing in the knowledge of the bible as well who remembers the food pyramid from the 90s remember that mm -hmm. yeah um, now if you're younger you might remember that they changed that here what 10 15 years ago to my plate we're not going to talk about that <laughs> Because that, that just doesn't give the illustration anything. So let me break down what that food pyramid was. It had four different levels that were meant to communicate how much you needed to each of each type of food every day. The bottom level was grains. And if you're diabetic, like some of us, you know, this is like you're the one you got to stay away from because it's full of the carbs. But that bottom level was grains, bread, potatoes, cereals. We made up, get this, 40% of our daily intake. And above that was the fruits, fruits and veggies, which is about 35%. Then there was meat and dairy, which is 20%. And then you have the fats, the oils, and the sweets mm -hmm. at 5%. By today's standard, this pyramid is way, way out of date. And there's a reason it's not still being taught because ultimately it doesn't do us a lot of good to go by that it's not very it's not as healthy as they thought it was but regardless the idea behind the food pyramid was simple it was a goal to show the non-negotiables of a healthy diet right 
So it answered the question, what is essential for a healthy life? Now we could ask the same question about discipleship. What is essential to deep discipleship? Now, so for the rest of this message, we're going to answer this multi-part question. What is essential to deep discipleship? The first answer is this guy, the Bible. This is number one. A disciple must grow in his or her knowledge of the scriptures. The Bible needs to be at the center of our Christian lives. The Bible is the very first thing in the Grace Street Church Statements of Beliefs. So on this next slide, I took a screenshot of our website, and because I know this is kind of small, I, I used my fun little skills and I blew it up and I put squares around it and lines to it so you can see it all. The very first statement in our Statement of Faith is this, the inspired scriptures, the scriptures both Old and New Testaments are the inspired and infallible revelation of God to man and the authority of faith and conduct. Now we use the GSC, but Grace Street Church accepts the Bible as the revealed will of God, as the all-sufficient rule of faith and standard for daily living. That's how important it is. We made it number one. God's word is authoritative. It is inerrant and it is sufficient for us to grow into being a healthy disciple of Christ. Scripture is God ordained. And that means it reveals God and that it gives himself to us. Now, it's impossible for us to be followers of Jesus unless we are students of his word. In 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, Paul encourages Timothy by highlighting the importance of scripture in Christian life. And this comes from the New Century Version. It says, all scripture is inspired by God and is useful for teaching, for showing people what is wrong in their lives, for correcting faults, and for teaching how to live right. Using the scriptures, the person who serves God will be capable, having all that is needed to do every good work. Now, if I switch gears and go to verse 16 in the New International Version, it's, we read it this way, the very first uh, few words says, all scripture is God. That means there is no substitute for the Bible in growing as disciples. We already talked about this. The Bible is God's revelation of himself to us. Scripture is not only where God makes himself known, but where he continues to make himself known over and over and over again. Now, if you don't hear another word I say this morning, because, you know, like I said, I listened to KWOF for years, and that's all I remember. <laughs> I did a job. You did a good job. If you hear nothing else this morning, hear this. There is no substitute for the Word of God. None. There is no addition to it, and there is no removing from it. Scripture warns us about that. So as you study your Bible, you'll find where that's at. Sometimes the teacher has to give you a, a make you wonder where something's at, so you go look at it when you leave. So that's not we're gonna leave that. But this is for our spiritual health. We do all kinds of things for our physical and mental health. Today I'm asking you to do something for your spiritual health. Read your Bible. Amen. Here's the thing. Read a verse. Read a chapter. Every day. Now, this is not just whenever. Every single day, read a verse. Read a chapter. Read a bunch of chapters. Read a whole book or two. Get caught up and just read all day long. The 
that no matter how much you read, you must listen to what God is saying to you. It's not just about the words being on the paper, because how easy is it to sit there and read something, and as you're reading it, you start glossing over it, and your mind starts going over here, over there, you start worrying about this or about that. No, we need to listen to what God is saying to us. We need to meditate on it. You're reading and you're reading through a chapter and all of a sudden you come across one verse or maybe even just one sentence of that verse. And it might only be a few words. But God said, stop. Meditate on this. Memorize it. Take it in. And now dive in. And, and when he's telling you to dive in, that means... If you've got a study Bible, great. Use that. If you don't have a study Bible, guess what? BibleGateway.com offers free commentaries and study Bibles on it. Dive into that. There's no excuse not to read the Bible and study it because there are free materials out there to do just that. Maybe it's getting on your phone and opening up the Bible app and choosing a Bible study based on on what God is telling you to meditate on. If you are serious about being a disciple, then you have to be committed to learning God's word. Because discipleship is growing in the knowledge of what we believe, of our Christian beliefs. This is the next step in discipleship. And that is to grow in the knowledge of what we believe. Now, go out to our website, scroll. You can click on I'm new. There's a link to Statement of Beliefs there. Go all the way to the bottom. There's a link down there. Find out what, as a church, we believe. Because these, they're, they're basically a foundation for all of this. And if you have questions, well, ask. That's why we do what we do. Now, growing in the knowledge of what we believe is called, and I'm probably going to get a lot of grief for using this word, it's called theology. Now, what, I'm not going to ask anybody to answer the question, but think about what goes through your mind when you hear the word theology. Now, just because I use that word, don't shut down, don't turn me off, don't ignore the rest of what God has for you this morning, but instead, listen to what God has for you this morning. You see, this, theology is an academic word. So is discipleship, by the way. But we're going to get more into this, and, and you may be asking, why can't we just say, we love God and let it be at that. That's all we need, right? No, there's more to it. Here's the thing. Theology, yeah, it's a big word, but guess what? You're already a theologian because you went, you've already started reading your Bible. You're already uh, committing to being a good theologian because, truth be told, it's the foundation Christian living. The term theology comes from two Greek words. Theos, which means God, and logos, meaning word. Basically, it translates like this. Words about God. That's what theology is. Nice and simple. Words about God. Or if God's word about himself. That's what theology is. Nice and easy, right? It's not that big academic word where you have to have a doctorate in theology to be able to use it. If I did, I'd be in trouble right now. The Bible police would be coming after me. But what could be more practical to us than words about God? Is there anything more important than understanding what God has said about himself? I don't think so. And I hope you don't either. Doctrine, oh, another big Word. Another $10 word. 
and discipleship go hand in hand. Simply put, theology is what we believe to be true about God. So here's another truth. Believe it or not, everyone believes something about God. That includes those that do not believe he exists because they believe something about God. They don't believe he exists. And no, to use words like uh, doctrine and theology, you do not need a seminary degree. You don't need a Bible college degree. You need practical teaching that comes from the Bible. So we are all theologians because, by definition, we all have words about God. Now, that degree that some of them may have means they've been taught about God and how to think about God, but does it mean they have been taught by God how to think about God? It's a little twist on the words there. Are they taking man's teaching about God or are they taking God's teaching about himself? That's where the Bible comes in. And here's, an, here's a question for you as it comes to that, that. We're all being discipled. The question is, by whom? The world? Or by God? Good theology helps us to know who God is, who we are in him, what the world is, and how we can be faithful disciples in the world that is out there. This is like... That's why they call this a sanctuary, because we are away from the world. Listen to what Paul says about this in his letter to the Colossians. This comes from chapter 1, verses 19 through 14. And this is from the English Standard Version. And Paul writes, And so from the day we heard, we have not ceased to pray for you, asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding so as to walk in a manny manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him, bearing fruit in every good work, and increasing in the knowledge of God, being strengthened with all power, according to his glorious might, for all endurance and patience, with joy. Joy. Giving thanks to the Father, who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. He has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son, in whom we have redemption for the forgiveness of sins. Growing deeper as a disciple means we are increasingly <clears throat> filled with the knowledge of God. That walk that we're on, we start off and we know a little bit about God, and the further we go down that path, that further that we go down our spiritual walk, the more we take in. And that so that's that increasingly filled with the knowledge of God part. So why? Because it is then and only then that we can walk in a manner that is worthy and pleasing to God. Knowledge of God leads to, leads to faithfulness, so we become faithful, but it also leads to fruitfulness. We cannot be fruitful and faithful to a God we don't know. That's why discipleship is also about growing in spiritual habits. This is the next crucial element of deeper discipleship. It's growing in spiritual habits or spiritual disciplines as, as the, we'll call that the $5 word this morning. <laughs> like theology, the word disciplines might have a negative connotation. Because when you think of disciplines, all the first thing that can't come to my mind is just getting disciplined by my parents when you know I did something wrong, or God disciplining us. Well, here's the thing: that's not what disciplines are. So let's talk more about that. Let's change this whole way of thinking and talk about disciplines as habits, things that we do. Now, good or bad, we all have habits. And we are all formed by what we do. If you have a bad habit, that is going to form who you are. 
if you have good habits, that will also form who you are. Saw a video online of a, of a young boy. I mean, he couldn't have been taller than this. And he's at the bus stop, and he's got like six or eight girls that are at that bus stop with him. It's a good habit. You know what he did? So here's the bus, and here's the door. And he stood like this while every single girl got on that bus before he turned and he went up the steps. Good habits, learning how to treat others with respect. So the habits we develop shape us into who we are and who we will become. So it's not only that we need to know doctrine, but we also need to learn how it can help us to live the way that God wants us to live. For our physical health, we need to do more than just work on our upper body. So you can go to the gym and you can work on your upper body strength, right? Or you can work on your lower body strength by um, sitting there and pushing weights with your feet or what have you. But if you do all upper body or all lower body, that kind of defeats the purpose. One part's going to be stronger than the other, right? It needs to all be done together. So that's what we need to think about as we're growing as disciples. We have to focus on more than just forming our minds through the scriptures. And we can do this two ways. One is corporate habits and one is individual habits. So corporate habits, let me explain what I mean by that because I'm not talking about a company. I'm not talking about, you know, where you go to work. I'm talking about corporate habits, things that we do together in community as a whole church or even as a small group like we do on Wednesday nights at Bible study. And the most obvious habit that we all have is we gather together for worship. That also means that uh, that consistent weekly attendance is essential to being a healthy disciple. Other corporate habits include prayer, giving, or maybe even fasting. Prayer is something we do every time we come together as a church. Through church uh, worship service, we pray multiple times. On Wednesday night, we can sometimes spend anywhere from 20 minutes in prayer, depending on what we have for prayers, or we could spend 45 minutes to an hour. It's important to spend time in prayer. We do not shy from that or shun from that. Spiritual habits should also be part of our personal discipleship plan. So this should include developing habits from the first two categories of discipleship we already talked about. That's reading the scriptures and increasing our knowledge of those scriptures. Additionally, it needs to include developing habits when it comes to the things we do corporately, prayer, fasting, but it also includes giving, service, and even more. So here's a question for you. Are you intentionally, or are you being intentional, excuse me, about developing your own spiritual habits? I recently switched from working my 10 to 6 thirds to working 8 to 5 for three weeks so that I could work with a training group. That means in order to spend my time with God in the morning, I'm getting up at 6 instead of later. Because it's important to spend time with God. I'm being intentional about it. And then, in, besides that, the most central and essential spiritual habit we have is prayer. Like consistent Bible reading, nothing can replace a life of prayer. Jesus teaches us how to pray. The teacher teaches we listen, we learn, and we go, and we use that. Now, he says this, When you pray, don't be like the hypocrites who love to pray publicly on street corners and in the synagogues. And this is from Matthew 6. Where everyone can see them. I tell you the truth, that is all the reward they will ever get. But when you pray, go away by yourself. And we saw a movie like this. Mm -hmm. Prayer Room. Yeah. If you haven't seen that movie, I, I highly recommend you getting it and watching it. Go away by yourself, shut the door behind you, and pray to your Father in private. Then your Father who sees everything will reward you. And when you pray, don't babble on and on as the Gentiles do. Because, you know, 
when they're babbling, uh, when they're praying, they're babbling, they're doing it so that they can draw attention to themselves. It's not a, an actual discussion or that they're having with God. And they think that their prayers are being answered, Jesus says, merely by repeating their words again and again. Don't be like them. For your Father knows exactly what you need, even before you ask Him. Pray like this. Our Father in Heaven, may your name be kept holy. May your kingdom come soon. May your will be done on earth as it is in Heaven. Give us today the food we need, and forgive us our sins as we for have forgiven those who sin against us. And don't let us yield to temptation, but rescue us from the evil one. If you forgive those who sin against you, your Heavenly Father will forgive you. But if you refuse to forgive others, your Father will not forgive your sins. That might be the passage you need to ruminate or spend time meditating on. Sometimes I do. Spend time reflecting on this passage, because when we pray the Lord's Prayer, we're praying something that Jesus specifically taught us, and it's something that you can make your own. Make it your own. When you pray for God's kingdom to come, pray for specific needs in the world, because it's evident that God's presence is not in all the places out there. And when you ask for your daily bread, tell God not what you want, because that's easy enough, tell him what you need. And when you ask for forgiveness, confess your specific sins. Kind of like we, what we did uh, through the Easter services where we had the cross up here and everybody wrote the things that they wanted to be let go of, the sins they wanted to let go of, and we nailed them to the cross. Then commit to doing this, not for today, not for tomorrow, for the rest of your life. And why? Because discipleship is a lifelong journey. We began by saying that God is the goal of discipleship. And we must end by saying that, since we can never fully comprehend all that God is, we will not fully be there in this about eternity. Mark said this many times. See, I, I listen to, so there's certain things in your sermons I listen to too. I hear things. Life ends. Eternity where? There's two choices. You get to choose by free will. Hopefully by our messages and by the Bible studies and by spending time with God both corporately and individually, you have made your decision where you, you want to be. Our thirst for God is only quenched by the living water that we get from Jesus. And I immediately get taken to the woman at the well, where he says this to her, but those who drink the water I give will never be thirsty again. It comes, it becomes a fresh bubbling spring within them giving them eternal life. If you're taking notes, that's from John 4.14. 4, that eternal life will be with God, and God is already there waiting for us. Whether you are at the beginning of your faith journey or well on your way down the road, we need to take the lessons we've learned today seriously. Our eternal destination depends on it. We all Jesus is not just good to us, he's good for us. It's like eating right, it's good for us. His grace, his mercy, his love, and his forgiveness are finite? No, infinite, endless. They're endless. So let's proclaim right along with Paul what he wrote to the Romans in chapter 11, 33 and 36. Oh, how great are God's riches and wisdom and knowledge. How impossible it is for us to understand his decisions and his ways. For who can know the Lord's thoughts? Who knows enough to give him advice? And who has given him 
so much that he needs to pay it back. For everything comes from him and exists by his power and is intended for his glory. All glory to him forever. Amen? Amen. God has invited you into a deep and rich relationship with himself. Now, I ask you one more question. And this comes from a movie that we recently, we've seen as well. And that movie ministry, I love that ministry too. But, um, if you remember from Do You Believe where the, the street preacher, he's got that cross on the wheels, he walks up to the, the pastor's car and the window's down, and he asks him if he believes. He said, well, yeah, I'm a pastor. What were the words out of his mouth? He said, what are you going to do about it? Father, we thank you for the words that you have given us today, for the importance of those words, what it means to be your disciple. Lord, we know it won't be an easy road, that the world will hate us because of it, that we might get canceled, as the world calls it today. We may be persecuted for it. We may be looked at differently because of our beliefs. But Father, you are more important than the world. Do not let us fall into the temptation of just going with the flow of the world. Let us show the world whom we belong to, why it is so important, why we have the hope we have, because you give us your grace, your mercy, your forgiveness, and your love. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Pastor Terry. As we come into our time for communion this morning, um, I would like you to think back and as we kind of think about being a disciple of Christ and, and what Jesus was teaching his disciples, I want you to think about that because the first thing he said to them was, come, follow me. And they didn't give a hundred excuses why they couldn't do it, but they followed him. And they followed him and they learned from him and they watched and they saw and they learned from the things that he did. And then one of the final things that he said to them is, where I am going, you cannot come with me. He was going to the cross to give himself up for everyone, for everyone. He says, where I'm going, you cannot follow me, but I will come back and take you with me. See, the journey wasn't over. The, it didn't end on Easter. That wasn't the end. It wasn't final. He said, it is finished, but he never said, it was over. It was over, because it wasn't over. That was the beginning of the end. And so we have that to look forward to in our journey with Christ as we disciple ourselves through our life journey. We have that to look forward to that we have more. The life here on earth might be finished, but through Christ and what he did on the cross, we have more. We have more to come. And that was going to be my message for today, but it's going to be for next week instead. So tune in. <laughs> so as we come into this time of communion today, let us reflect on that, that, you know, it is finished, but it's not over. Christ made a sacrifice of his life for us so that we could continue our journey on. It's not over. On the night that he was betrayed, he took bread and he broke it. He said, this is my body, which is broken Later on in the meal, he took the cup, and after he filled it and he blessed it, he said, This cup is the new covenant, my blood shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. And each time that you 
eat of this bread and drink of this cup, do it in remembrance of me. Remember his mighty act of salvation. Remember that it is finished, but it's not. Come into this time today we will share together in community as as uh, Terry said corporately we take communion together as an act for Christ for what he has done for us the body of Christ broken for you and the blood of Christ shed for you We come into our time of prayers with the people, and uh, <coughs> so if you'd like to come forward, it's a great opportunity to share. What's that? <laughs> uh, good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, it's great to be here this morning, and it's beautiful outside. And Steve and I want to thank all of you for your prayers this week. We are so grateful for family and friends that help us get through life's trials. And, um, you know, there's no shame in prayer. We all need each other. And we can't live this life alone. Even though we think we can sometimes. We can't. So, God made us human. And he made us all to reach out to one another and, and you know, share our trials with each other so that we can get through each and every day. So I thank God for all of you, and I thank God that he made us the way we are. So with that, is there is there any more that would like prayer today? Yeah. Prayers for a co-worker who, um, her grandfather is passing. I know um, that family is here with him, so they're, okay. it's, it's just, brings me to Psalms 31 7 I will rejoice and be glad in your steadfast love because you have seen my affliction you have known the distress of my soul father God you are our shelter our refuge we want to abide in you when storms of trouble rage all around us we know that we who trust in you are safe father God I lift up Colleen her family and her grandpa Lord Jesus be with them during this sad time that they're going through but let them rejoice in you Father God for we know what is to come and we know that there is heaven and hope in this life so comfort them as they go through this trial Lord Jesus be with them always and Father God for the the car accident that Mark mentioned, God knows who this person was or these people that have been in this accident. I pray that you lift them up, Lord Jesus, and heal the ones that are still here. Heal their hearts and their minds, Lord Jesus. Comfort the family that lost their loved ones and just be with them. Thank you, Jesus, for your love for all of us. Father God, I lift up Don and I pray that you let the Holy Spirit abide in him. Lift up him, Lord Jesus, and heal his nerve pain, his, uh, his hand, his nerve pain in his hand. Father God, just heal the, the spine that he, that's um, 
in distress, Lord Jesus, and give him comfort for each new day. I pray for protection and shelter and food for the homeless. Father God, comfort them in their trials. Be near to them, walk with them, help them to know they are loved and not alone. You are God, and there is nothing impossible for you. In Isaiah 43, 10 and 11, before me, no God was formed, nor will there be one after me. I, even I, am the Lord, and apart from me, there is no Savior. Therefore, we set our eyes on you, O God. We thank you for life and breath each new day. We praise your holy name. Thank you, Jesus, for walking on this earth, dying on the cross, and rising from the dead. And thank you for those of us that we can choose to be to believe in you and we will be set free from sin and death you are God and there is no other thank you Jesus for who you are we praise your holy name later today because Bruce is uh, Bruce and Shannon family are off helping uh, his daughter down in Pella. She's still nearly not quite two years from the derecho. She's still getting some work done as we see many having that happen. This picture I chose because of the, the sermon this morning because I talked about praying together as a family so we have little hands up to the parents but also corporate as we come together. So this is an individual and a corporate example of prayer. I have a couple of things for you. I have a, a, some scripture to, to send you out by, but before we do that, let's pray. You and I are God's servants. We are gifted with his dreams and his visions. Upon each of us rests the grace of God like flames of fire. Love and serve the Lord in the strength of his spirit. May the peace of Christ be with you, the strong arms of God sustain you, and the power of the Holy Spirit strengthen you in every way. Amen. Amen. Paul wrote this in Ephesians 16 and 21. I pray that from his glorious unlimited resources, he will empower you with inner strength through his spirit. Then Christ will make his home in your hearts as you trust in him. Your roots will grow down into God's love and keep you strong. And may you have the power to understand as all God's people should how wide, how long, how high, and how deep his love is. May you experience the love of Christ Though it is too great to fully understand, then you will be made complete with all the fullness of life and power that comes from God. Now all glory to God who is able, through his mighty power at work within us, to accomplish infinitely more than we might ask or think. Glory to him in the church and in Christ Jesus through all generations, forever and ever. And as Paul wrote, amen. amen. Thank you for